Welcome to Optimal Game State. This week we had our very first Warcry meta watch from Games Workshop. This was notable for a number of reasons. Just having it shows that GW are taking Warcry and specifically match play for Warcry seriously. We also got to hear from the leading game dev, John Bracken. I'll have the video linked in the notes, but if you haven't done so yet, I'd highly recommend listen. He says all of the right things. When he talks about the game, it's clear he understands better meta of Warcry. He uses the same terms that the Warcry community used, like Titan. He also talks about the future of the game and the direction they hope to take. It should put some rest to rubbish rumors floating around. And honestly, listening to John gives me a lot of faith in the direction of the game. The major topic for discussion, of course, was the new FAQ, which was an extensive shakeup of the meta. It has some rules clarifications, some tweaks to abilities, a points review, and what we're looking at in this video, a large number of new fighter profiles. These are all for new models that have come out in the Age of Sigma range recently, but didn't have Warcraft rules. This is good for us and for Games Workshop. If we can play these models, we will buy these models. It's a win-win. I'm not going to go into great detail with the changes. You can check out some of the other Warcraft channels for a more detailed overview, but I did want to mention a few of them in passing. Fight for Profit has had a tweak, making it slightly less powerful. So before it was plus one attack to really enraged, and plus two if you had the treasure or an objective. Now it's always plus one, and if there's no treasure or objective, then it only works for melee. So it's toned down, but still quite good. Chorus Cabal got their terrain-related rules reduced from three inches to two inches, which matches a lot of the current terrain a little bit better. It's a minor tweak, but this, along with some point adjustments, should help out the warband. Cypher Lords are no longer restricted to just Cypher Lords for the teleport ability, and it no longer has a 12-inch range limit. Now, outside of the Cypher Lords, there are a number with uh, in Chaos with the minion rumor that you could loop into this that I find kind of interesting. So we have a bunch of Skaven from Scritch's Warband, we've Hadzu from the Dread Pageant, and the Brimstone Horrors from the Eyes of Night. There are also a few Bliss Barb heroes that you could ally in. Nighthaunt got a big change. Frightful Touch is now usable by anyone in the faction. It's a triple that turns hits into crits. The fighters that previously had it will get an extra plus one attack dice on top of this, so it is a nice buff across the board for what otherwise has been a weak warband. Again, we get a ton of points adjustments for them as well, so there's a good chance that you're going to actually be making some, you know, decent night hunt lists, which could be fun. The last one I want to mention here is the Sons of Elmorn getting the elite blue mark. So this means that when they get returned from the dead to summon undead minions ability, they will come back with damage. It's a minor enough thing, but it brings them in line with the rest of the fighters in the warband and yeah, tones down the power level of the faction a little bit. They're all still completely playable, completely usable, but it just brings them in line with the graveyard. These are all good changes. So you're getting some minor adjustments, buffing weak warbands and tweaking strong ones like the Slave Darkness and the Crash and Overlords. As I mentioned, there are a ton of points adjustments. You can see here that the Canine Shadowstalkers are getting some discounts, and they were the weakest warbands out there. Karadron Overlords are getting some points increases, and they were the top ones. Everything I've seen is a good change, and mostly there's just been minor tweaks. I'm delighted to see the weak factions are getting boosts, which isn't something you often see. And overall, though, it does feel like the design team are familiar with the meta, and these changes will make the game a lot more fun going forward. Uh, I have updated my own Warcry dashboard, where you can look at some of the, the numbers you want. In the overall list, damage per point, you can see that the Grave Guards have dropped from number one, where they previously were, to number three, and the Paladin with Dark Hunt Mace has dropped out of top five altogether, although it does still remain one of the most efficient uh, damage per points for order. Again, this is all linked in the description, so you can play around with that tool if you want. We get a ton of new profiles in this FAQ. I think it's 28 in total, uh, which for other games, other releases, would be a massive buck. Uh, it does look like they're actively trying to close that gap of AOS fighters that can't yet play in Warcry. So the end goal is that almost anything, except for maybe some like chariots or some uh, main characters, that everything in Age of Sigmar should be playable in Warcry, which I think is great. Yeah. In particular, the Seraphon got a really big update. Now, mostly that's for the Riders, but we also got the Crocs Gore and they spawn Shotek. 
we recently did get rules for the Flesh Eater Quartz box, and before that, the City of the Sigmar box. So this kind of closes that loop for some of the previous boxes. I think there still are a few gaps, but hopefully we'll see that get filled out as we go along. Um, I'd like to think, personally, that GW noticed a difference in their sales. I certainly bought the Cities of Sigmar box to play Warcry. So, these are the new fighters, uh, all falling well to the expected bands. So we don't have anything that's too shocking. So there's nothing spiking outside uh, you know, that damage chart. There's nothing too crazy on the wounds. And um, yeah, I, again, this is a tool that you can play around with. It has all been fully updated with the new profiles, um, so you can have a luxury and see what you think. Let's get into some fighters. So we're going to start with the Grim Hold Exile for Fire Slayers. His damage and wounds are about right for the points cost, 165, which is strange as you'd normally see a big discount for three move. So he might be a little bit overcosted, I kind of want to say. Um, now, the Fire Slayers do have a plus three movement boost with single move for a double, which, you know, that's something that you could be able to get this guy into combat relatively straightforward. The ability is a straight damage one. You're always rolling six dice, and each dice will do one damage on a four plus. So basically, it's an average of three damage. It gets a high wounds target, so over 30 wounds, which I was going to say is relatively rare, but a lot, we're seeing a lot of them in this particular update. And we'll get into them as you see them later. And yeah, so there might be a lot of 30 wound fighters floating around in a meta. Something to keep in mind with. This Grim Hold Exiled ability is quite good for that. So, okay, yeah, so the numbers. Each 3 plus will do half the value of the dice. So this is against wounds 30 or more. So 4 dice should work. So that's 3 plus out of the 6 dice you rolled. And if you're doing it with a triple 6, you're going to do 3 damage per dice, which is an average of 12 damage. Now, that's not bad for triple, but it's only really going to be worth it when you're facing off against big guys. Um, and yeah, as I said, there are a bunch of big guys in this, but the uh, former Red Crusher has been one of the kind of key elements of the meta up till recently. He did get a points increase. He's probably still going to be playable and still making the attendance. Something to keep in mind. Cradron Overlords get the code right at a very affordable 95 points. Wounds are great for the points, but the damage is quite poor. Really, you're taking this guy for abilities. As a Cradron hero, you do get 5 for profit, and although the ability has been told down, it's still quite good. You could still get all of that for 5 points cheaper with the company Captain Dome, so we need to get a little bit more out of this. Okay, if we look at the unique double, it's called, I think you'll find, dot dot dot, once triggered, an enemy fighter or enemy fighters cannot use abilities or reactions until a friendly fighter activates until the end of the battle round. As a double, this is relatively easy to trigger. If you use it at the start of the code rights activation, then as far as I understand, it could save you from an enemy reaction. Kind of minor though, especially considering how poor the profile is. Really what you're looking to do with the code rights is play a small war band, so not many fighters and then use the code rack as your last fighter. That means that every fighter your opponent has left and all those ability dice left for turn that they haven't yet used are completely wasted. If you've got six fighters and they've got 15, then over half their warband isn't gonna be able to use abilities. This will actually push your opponent in activating their best fighters first and using their abilities early, at which point you don't actually need to use the ability. It's a bit of a weird one. But I think this could be a very, very nice element in some elite or bats. Seraphon gets a ton of models. Uh, so my notes say we're going to get through this quickly, but I don't. We're going to take it one step at a time. We have two kinds of Raptodon. So we have either the Chargers, which we're going to look at here, or the Hunters, which we'll see in a second. Each have the Normal Fighter and the Hero Alpha. All the Raptodons have this fantastic movement of 10, a very weak 2 toughness, and a relatively poor wound for the points. They are basically just skinks on Dinosaur. All of the Seraphons do have a reaction which they can trigger before melee attack against those rolled. Then up to 2 crits get downgraded to hits. This certainly helps survivability, but it's always rough losing action. Damage, similarly, isn't great for the points cost, but you do kind of expect that with these super fast units. The minion rune mark gives these fighters access to a double nimble retreat, which lets them take a free disengage. So they can charge in, do a little bit of damage, and then disengage. 
Alternatively, they could spend that double on wrapped on tactics, which is basically pulling extra duty. Um, now, I ignore the first part, which is actually for the hunters, so we'll see that in a second. So instead, we're going to focus on a plus two attack dice for the rest of the turn. At five attacks, the normal charge is going to do 3.3 average damage. It's not a massive increase, but at least in terms of raw damage, it's better than the universal onslaught. Moving over to the hunters. Now we've traded out the clubs for a spear and the blowgun, I think. Wait, no. I don't think it's bows. It must be a blowgun. Um, you do lose one strength, but as that's dropping from three to two, you're probably going to be tar hitting tar toughness two or toughness four anyway. So that's actually not going to make any difference. You can you do get reach, so you get reach of two on the melee weapon, which is big. Uh, but as the profile has a ranged weapon, you can't choose the plus two attacks from Raptor on Tactics. Yeah. The ranged weapon is also quite modest, but it is handy to have. In this case, the ability gives you a bonus move action equal to the value of the ability dice. So if your target is close enough, you can use the double to move, getting within that two inch range and get a double attack. I like them. The models are very, very nice. The ability is fun, even if the profile isn't necessarily too exciting. Then we have the Agridons. This is a series of Saurus riding bigger dinosaurs, and they are quite scary. We're going to start here with the Scar Veteran, which is the cream of the crop, at a chunky 295 points. Although wounds and damage are closer to 250, after a certain point I kind of feel that doesn't really matter anymore. Now, fighters with 30 wounds require a lot of effort to kill, and 9 average damage is going to get a lot of work done. That all comes with an 8 move, which is super, super nice. As a Seraphon hero and a warrior, we also get some nice abilities. Cold-Blooded Commander is a double that gives an extra move for attack after kill, an ability that has a lot of value on a profile like this. The Warrior Rune Arc gives a triple tearing bite, which adds the value of the triple to hits and crits on the next attack. So that could be a massive damage boost for single attack. Alternatively, you can go for the Predatory Leap ability instead, which gives a bonus move uh, action of 3 inches, uh, which also gets Fly. Now, that's actually really big for a mounted unit, because it means that they can jump up or over uh, terrain that they couldn't otherwise get over. And um, You do get to do some bonus damage on top of that, so it's the typical cavalry charge ability that we often see. Have to admit, I think it's quite fun, uh, and it's notable that the warrior and mounted rune marks open this up to a lot of existing uh, fighters, such as Saurus Knights. The normal Agridon launchers are no surprise a step down, but have similar rune marks and abilities. So the leader is 50 points cheaper than the Scar Veteran, losing 3 damage. The normal launchers are 60 below, losing another 1.6 to 5. It's all still 8 move and 20 wounds, and uh, it's got, you know good damage, and with that right triple can do some considerable impact. The normal Lancers are another 60 below that, losing another 1.6 damage to 5. It's still move 8, 20 wound killer, that with the right triple can do considerable damage. A conservative triple, for example, will bring the average damage to a chunky 9.5, even if that's just for one attack. The spear version drops the damage a little in exchange for a reach 2. It does this by dropping the damage on a hit by two, but increasing the damage on a crit by one. Everything we've said before applies, but with a slightly greater threat range. I'd argue that the average or the extra damage is going to have a little more impact, but as the World of Warcry gets scarier and scarier, forcing your opponent to spend an action is going to be quite valuable. Moving on, we have the spawn of Chotek, which seems to be a type of Dimitridon. There are no special abilities for this fighter beyond the generic Zephyron ones. Um, it's a beast, so no opening doors or carrying treasure. At 130 points, you are getting good value with the wounds of 18. Uh, and while the damage isn't great, um, and the melee damage is actually worse than the range attack, but that is something I do like to see. So this fighter is looking to get into that 3 to 7 range and do two attacks doing an average of 3 damage. That range 7 is a lot but it is enough to cause some, some havoc. I quite like these kind of profiles. Um, I think if you can get into position and you're able to do six damage from that range, it can be pretty good. Croxagore are even bigger than the massive Saurus. These fighters come in around 200 points, and although there's a slightly different profile for the Warspawn, they aren't heroes. 
apart from the worst wands doing some more damage for that five points, you also get some different abilities. Uh, those big clubs do give them a reach of two, uh, again, which is always something handy. Now, the normal Croxagore has the Brute Ruler Mark, which gives them brutal blows. This gets them half the value of the double as a bonus to the attacks characteristic. So that's going to be one to three more dice. That they have only two dice at the start makes this a considerable boost, basically it's a bonus attack. Unfortunately, it is the next attack only rather than the full turn, but it's still pretty powerful. As warriors, they do have access to Terry Bite, a double, but Brutal Blows is probably going to be better. The War Spawn has the Sentience Rune Mark, which worries me for some reason. The ability it opens up is another double, Spawn of Sotek. You get plus two to attacks for the turn when within six inches of a fighter with the Minion Rune Mark. So that's mostly the skinks, which is within melee or has taken damage. Although it is a little bit more effort, it doesn't seem too hard to line up. Notably, if you're only getting a single attack, the normal Croxagore will end up doing better damage. If you're making two attacks, then the War Spawn is going to be better as long as they can trigger that ability. Um, but when the double ability has a value of one to four, that's when the War Spawn is better. If it's five to six, then the Croxagore actually wins out. Based on that, I'm tempted to say just run the normal Croxagores even if it does mean you're a little bit more dependent on the value of those doubles. That's order out of the way. We only have one new profile for death, and that's the Mortison Ossifector for the Ossiarch Bone Reapers. This is a pretty typical caster profile that we've seen similar with with the Spawn Chotek. It's also very similar to the Battle Mage and the Sorcerer from the Seeds of Sigmar. The range of 7 isn't massive, but it is decent, and being able to activate and drop an average of 6 damage on the target is pretty nice. Unlike the spawn, we do have abilities here. First off, we have the Ossiarch Hero ability, which is their triple unstoppable advance. So that adds half the value of the ability to move characteristics of fighters in the same battle group. Um, as a triple, it's a bit of a pain to get a good value on it, but still it is a very, very nice ability. So really really good to see the Oss effector also has its own special ability which is a double called refined creations this is very similar to to the brew get although in this case it's on a much more expensive uh, model but far more useful profile so you target an ossiarch fighter with the fly rune mark that's either going to be the morgast harbinger or the morgast archai each of which can come with halberds or swords that's four different profiles the Archai have one more toughness, but lose access to a triple for bonus move. Um, and since the damage is the same, otherwise I'm tempted to stick with the Harbinger. The Source profile is five cheaper, and in addition, to, uh, but in addition to Reach, the Halberd actually does slightly more damage with less dice. That less dice is important. Sorry, I've gone on a bit of a tangent here, but we're still on this double refined creations. After picking your target, so we're saying it is going to be a Harbinger with Halberd, and you then add half the value of the ability to the attacks characteristics of the next melee attack made by that fighter. So Harbinger with Halberd, who does 7 average damage, uh, if they get a double 6, that would get an extra 7 damage. If you happen to have your Ossifector already beside your big guy, and you have a double 5 and a double 6, which is best case scenario, you could actually pass and use one ability and then activate and use the second ability. That would make the first attack nine dice, which would do an average of 21 damage. And you can still use abilities with the Harbinger if you want to, and if you have any dice left over. So yeah, I really, really like it. It's a very, very simple and very, very neat combo. You just have your Oss Effector move into position on turn one, I guess. You get to use that triple that all of the heroes in this war might have, and then you uh, boost up your Harbinger and uh, go to town and just alpha strike something. Moving over to destruction, the Gloom Spike gets got a bundle more options. First up, we have the Snarlfang Riders, which have a hero and a normal version. These are super fast at 10 move and are hurled with spears and bows. They're Quite expensive, uh, but they do seem to be good value. Wounds are about right for 125 points, while damage is closer to about 110. But movement 10 does come at a big tax. 
So yeah, it's not, not a shock we're seeing out of 175 points there. The hero is quite similar, but upscale slightly, of course. Now, these don't have the mounted rune mark, which is a bit strange. That doesn't necessarily have to be a mistake, though. There are some units where the mount is considered smart enough or agile enough uh, to you know, justify not having the mount, limit, the mount uh, limitation. I'm thinking now of the Drac lines in the Stormcast. As gets, these, these gobbos get the standard generic actions. So the gets reaction is pile in. After an enemy fighter finishes in a move action within three inches of the reacting fighter, they can use their action to give another get a bonus move as long as they end up complete. Now, you're probably not going to use the ability of the Snarlfangs, but you could use them. You could have another fighter activate them with us, give them that free move. Uh, that the Snarlfangs are super fast means they can be there for the other gets when they need to, and that'll mean they get to attack twice when they do activate. That said, the Snarlfangs do have reach, so getting into one inch melee range probably isn't where they want to be. Um, so they also get access to the double backstabbing mob, which will give them plus one attack and strength to melee actions when uh, next to their gets. So that's nice. Their special ability, though, is a is can't catch us. Another double. I really like this one. This can only be used if they've taken a range attack. Uh, and luckily, you don't have to do any damage. So, uh, so you fire with the bow. And then activate the ability, and it gives you a bonus move equal to the value of the ability. So it's going to be 1 to 6, depending on the dice. That means you can ping with a range attack, but then use the ability to move in and get to use your second action as a spear attack. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, now, one thing to be aware of is that bonus move is equal to the value of the ability. <laughs> Don't think that's going to cause you any problems though because you don't necessarily have to move in a straight line so <laughs> you could twist and turn a little bit before you get in to be just uh far enough from that two inches yeah so you should we find out it's not like any of the pulls because they say directly to in this case yeah you just get a free move and you can be as windy as you want okay um Oh yeah, there is also a kind of a weird quirk with this. Since they do have the scout rune mark, they do end up with access to the spore cloud reaction, which is from the spore spore plata fanatic. This is probably a mistake. The reaction gives friendly fighters cover from range attacks if they're uh, near the Snarl Fang. Uh, it, now it's only plus one toughness, uh, so it's not a big deal. I think it's honestly it's unlikely to be used, but uh, yeah, it's just normal that it is there. As an aside, I do think this is an absolutely gorgeous box. I think these models are some of the best ones that GW have done for doubles. A full box would come to 915 points for Warcraft. It might not be a great list, but it could be a lot of fun. There are also two new heroes for uh, the Gobbos. You've got the Rabble Rouser, and you've got the Squid Boss with Ganasha Squig. Both are close in points and have 16 wounds, which is about right for that 100 points. The Squig Boss is doing slightly better damage and does have reach, making his weapon profile a bit better. The special ability for the Squig Boss with its Brute Rune Mark is Mysophile's Pouch. This is a double that boosts all your nearby Squigs with plus one attack, whether they are the normal ones with the Beast Rune Mark or the Riding Squigs with the Fly Rune Mark. So I think that's pretty cool. Rabble Rouser has a Sentience Rune Mark, which gives it the Overhear Your Lug double. This lets you pick out an enemy monster, and until the end of the battle round, it cannot move away from the Rabble Rouser. Hmm. I think it's pretty niche. Um, I'm not sure monsters are even commonly allowed in tournaments, or whether they've just been priced out. Um, and yeah, I imagine if there was a monster, it would just take that turn to eat the rabble rouse and be done with it. So, hmm. Uh, again, this does have access to the poison brew ability. So this is coming from the spike or gobble from the gobble of Palooza fighters. Again, I feel this might be a mistake because um, the gobble of Palooza fighters are in a bit of a weird section all to themselves. Technically, they're part of the gifts, but uh, you could easily over over overlook it and i think that maybe is well designed done maybe not though as the rubble rouser with just uh, the over here you lug ability does feel quite weak and um, poison brew is a double that lets you pick a available friendly within three inches and boost their strength for the value of the ability although it is only just for that next attack so it is something at least now i feel maybe i've missed something with rubble rouser but i 
I, I don't think I really get why you're going to be take to your character, despite uh, a, a more of a model. Last for destruction, we have the Blood Pelt Hunter for the Ogre Mod Drives. As I've mentioned a few times, I do like profiles where the double range attacks are better on average than, than a move and a single melee attack. At 280 points, this is a big chunky hero, but then almost all the others are. We can compare with the Blood Pelt Hunter against the Ice Bow Hunter, who is the same price. Then the Blood Pelt does have better range damage, but has worse melee damage by 3, which does feel significant. So Blood Pelt is a better range fighter. That range profile, though, is similar to the Fire Belly and the Butcher, who are at 225 and 230 points, so considerably cheaper. And they're both doing 4.5 damage rather than 4.6. So it's a big points discount, but not much of a damage drop. All right, let's look at the abilities. So first we have the generic over abilities. So a double that gets a move or attack after kill, not as nice to have. And that backs to yes. The rest of the generic ogre abilities are locked behind the brute rune mark, which the blood spelt hunter, blood spelt hunter does not have. And um, that was there to separate the ogres from the yeti, frost hero, and ogres. So I think this is a mistake. And I think the blood uh, pelt hunter should have the brute rune mark, although it's an easy enough mistake. We have already seen the same issue with Frostcart, um, who again doesn't have it. Maybe it's intentional. I don't know. Uh, nonetheless, okay. The special ability that we have is the triple haul them in. Uh, it gives a bonus action, which is great. And our bonus attack. And then a harpoon pull equal to the value of the ability in inches. So it is a triple four, four would pull back the target four inches. It doesn't say up to, so it does have to be the exact amount. So be careful with that. Um, you would prefer to drag the target into your reach of two, which would then open up uh, your melee attacks. This kind of ability is super good. And if you wanted to, you could just use it uh, with the melee uh, and because you do just get a bonus attack action. So it doesn't necessarily have to be with the range ability, which is kind of funny. Although that would then still pull it into melee with you. So it might not be a, a great option. Um, yeah. So yeah, these kind of abilities are great. The, the fact that you're getting an extra attack is obviously great. Um, but being able to pull the target back to it, it has lots of ways in which it's useful. The most obvious one is you get to uh, do your melee actions, but if you have another fighter next to the hunter, they will also benefit from that target getting pulled in. There are also a bunch of shenanigans you can do with pulling targets away from objectives or just off of buildings. Um, so yeah, as I said, wasn't quite too impressed with this fighter at the start, but I have to admit, I really love harpoon effects, so I think that really just has won it over for me. Moving over to Chaos, we have the Lord of Hubris from the Head Knights of Slanesh, Cyberite Warband. This is a fantastic model and a great fighter. It is a super cheap 155. Wounds are about right for 165. Attack profile is more like 120, but it's all on a move 5 profile, so that's really, really good. Interestingly, uh, okay, yeah. So it's an interesting fighter, but not super amazing yet. As a Cyberite, there are some nice abilities. The reaction is share pain, which does damage back for each attack that hits or crits. So it's a different take on counter. There is a double unrivaled velocity, which gives plus three to movement for one action, which can be a really nice burst of speed. As a cyberite hero, they have the double to get a bonus move or attack after a kill. All really good abilities. And what you're probably here for though is the the unique ability for this particular character. So it is a double. You first, I insist. You give an enemy fighter in melee with you a free attack. After that, you get a bonus of two dice and two strength for the rest of the Lord's activation against the target, along with three extra damage points to the crit damage. So the average damage pops up to 12 per attack, which is pretty insane. So this guy has been dubbed a bit of a chaff killer. And the idea here is if a fighter has about 10 health, I guess, you can move up to it, Triggered ability, expect to take two or three damage because it's only chaff, and then pretty reliably kill it. Now, if he has to go up against a Titan, if you know a Titan engages with him and is stuck in combat with him, he can probably take a single big hit. So he still does have 20 wounds. If he's coming in from fresh, he you know he could take a hit of 10. 
uh, and then this ability would let him turn out about 24 average damage across two attacks, assuming he, you know, he was already moving. That's pretty good. Have to admit, I really like this fighter. It's also a really good model, so uh, yeah, it's a win-win. The Magakin of Nurgle, Rotbringers, get the Harbinger of Decay with Doombell. Now, there is already Harbinger of Decay for the older model, which just sat beside. It's 195 points with 5.3 average damage with a reach weapon. Stats are the same as we're looking at here, uh, and it has a special ability with a triple that gives it a bonus melee attack. The new profile is the one with the Doom Bell, which is an optional build for the new kit. So in this new case, you can build it for either of the two profiles. That said, I suspect you could play with either profile with the same model and no one really care. All right, but let's look at this new profile. Woods are great. It's worth about 210 points. Damage is quite poor. You're probably going to get that same damage for 75. And it doesn't have a reach like its, uh, its side-wielding buddy. Um, and yeah, part of this, I guess, is that the Ropringers faction tend to have lots of wounds. They're like hard to kill um, and tough. This is a fast profile. It does have six move, which is very, very nice. Um, it doesn't have the mounted rumor, but we think it probably does. We think this one was a mistake. And the reason we think it's a mistake is because the other version of it, without the Doom Bell, does have a, does have the Meta Rumor. Okay, so what else do we have here? Okay, yeah, we've got the typical Rock Bringer re abilities. So the reaction that reduced damage taken, the double that does damage to your nearby enemy, and a triple that is the same as Universal Reprieve, but the healing is doubled. So it's a much better heal. Uh, and as a hero, it does get a triple that boosts melee attacks of nearby fighters by one. So common enough that we've seen before. The special ability, though, is what we're really here for. The special ability for this fighter is a Toll of the Doom Bell. It's a quad. Quads are unreliable, and you're always comparing them against Rampage, which, you know, with a free move and a free attack, is one of the best abilities out there. <laughs> so, my normal recommendation wouldn't be to take a fighter just for an ability. This effect could win games, though. So once triggered, it stops your opponent from using abilities or reactions while they're within seven inches of the Harbinger. Sticking the Harbinger in the middle of the board is going to end up with a massive area of effect for this. The base is about 3.5 by 2 inches, and then it's going to stretch seven inches on either side. So it's going to be something like a 16 diameter on one side and a 17.5 diameter on the other side. And that's a sizable chunk of that 30 by 3 board. Sorry, 30 by 22 board. Now, you can kill the Harbinger to end the effect, but you still have uh, 25 wounds to get through. As a Rockbringer player, it might be worthwhile getting him into position, try to keep him safe, and then when you're using the ability, do it with a pass. That'll leave you a reaction, or an ability to, an action to use a reaction to reduce the damage taken. This is a very, very interesting fighter. I think it could be very good in competitive games. If you can manage to trigger the ability in the last two turns of the game, it could be game winning. So if you've got, you know, you're looking to have a wild dice ready and you're looking to roll into a triple naturally. You're not going to be able to bring a double to a quad. It's just not something you can do in the game. But if you do manage to roll into a triple on either of the two last turns and then, uh, change that into a quad with wild. You don't have to worry about the values. And then the first thing you're going to do as soon as you activate is you're going to pop it straight away. So your opponent will have at least, at, at best, one turn in which to trigger their abilities. And then after that, it's done. That could be amazing. I don't think I would play this in friendly games, though. Um, having multiple turns, or even just one turn where you just can't use any of your dice or any of your abilities, would feel pretty horrible. Next up, we have the Chaos Chosen. So these are basically the classic Chaos Warriors, but with two hand weapons. They did have previous profiles, but these are globs, making them a little bit more in line with uh, as enemies of the Stormcast and kind of giving them profiles that are a little bit more appropriate to the new models they receive. Looking at the normal fighter first, the wounds 20 and the damage profile are both worth around 165 points. So we are getting rid of this guy. That this is a five toughness model is a little bit bonus. The general Slaves to Darkness abilities are a reaction that gives three health back and a double which boosts strength. Maybe not so important since we're starting with five strength. 
warrior rune mark opens up a quad which can only be used after killed and has three dice to attack by frenzies within six inches for a rest to rest. So pretty good, but again, it's quad. The champion is similar. The wounds are about right for 200 points, while the damage would match to 15. So it is a really solid fighter stat wise. For abilities, in addition to the ones just mentioned, the hero rune mark also opens up the triple champion of darkness, which can only be triggered after a kill and gives some extra or gives an extra move and an extra attack. So, really solid fighters, uh, ah, yeah. and it just goes with a, a lovely model. At the same time we got the Chosen, we also got the Pterodons. So they came in the in that one big save starting box. These are definitely one people have been keen to play, and uh, sometimes have ended up using uh, the profile of the Ogre and Mormodon as kind of a step in. So we have a hero and a fighter option for this unit, and we also get to choose between Falchion and Shield, which we'll look at first, and then the two-handed axe. These are super chunky. 28 health is worth about 230 points, and with the shields, they're at toughness 6, which makes them super hard to kill. They're fast at 5 moves, which doesn't seem like a lot, but at one point difference can actually be considerable. The damage profiles aren't super sexy. They've got 6.6, .6, which you'd expect on 165 point and a fighter. It does feel a bit weird that the leader coughs um, more, but you don't actually get anything at all in the stats. The stats are identical. Now, it does give you access to that Slave to Darkness hero triple, and I think that is quite important. Um, and it, this is also the profile that any Chaos Warbands outside of the Slave to Darkness will get access to. On a quick comparison to Myrmidon, uh, the Torakon, the leader, uh, costs 65 points less and loses 3.5 damage, uh, gaining reach. Their special ability is a double Unleashed Savagery, which can only be used once per battle. You roll dice equal to the value, so let's say 6, and for each 4+, plus, so half the dice, you will end up adding 1 to the strength and the attack to the next melee attack. So yeah, we're probably looking at 3 attack dice and strength, if you've managed to get into a double 6, which is too hard for a double 5. The strength is probably not going to make too much of a difference, but the attack dice would be close to a 3 bonus attack. It's really good. The extra bonus. If you have a Myrmidon within 6 inches, then those guys dice get plus 1, so it will succeed on 3 plus. It could be pretty random though, and it is a little bit weird as one for battle. Anyway, some incredibly hard to kill fighters and some good damage. Now, there is an extra twist to all of that, but we'll talk about that in a second. So, first let's look at the second set of profiles, which are the Great Axe. I think this is probably where you're going to go with. They do cost a lot more though, so it's 25 points more for the Pterodon, gaining about one average damage reach, importantly, and losing one toughness. For a leader, the Torcon, that's 65 more points, and gains around 3.5 of a damage increase, which is significant. And that did make me wonder a little bit if the Torcon with Falchion and Shield should have had more damage, but the increase between the Tardon and the Torcon, so the normal fighter of the leader, uh, there was only 15 points, while here, Great Axe was 55 more points, so yeah, the damage difference would make a little bit more sense. Everything we've said before still counts, same great ability. Um, the twist, of course, is that the Ferocious Rune is the target of one of the Blade of Corn abilities. The 165 point Bloodstoker has an ability called Whipped to Fury, which is a double that gives a Ferocious Fighter a bonus attack action. Previously, you would have used that with Corngrass, which it locks within the Blades of Corn because of the spider. In theory, now though, you can take a Toracon and Bloodstoker in any Chaos list. That's 440 points and can be pretty scary. Uh, similarly, you can just take your Bloodstoker in uh, one six darkness list and use it with any of the Pterodons. As a side note, a box of these, they come in threes, built with axes and then a Myrmidon as well. So that's four fighters in total, is 990 points. Not a great list, but it could be a lot of fun to play. All right, that's all I have for this episode. Uh, this new FAQ and the MetaWatch video was fantastic for the game. It's also worth noting that we have a really, really great community. Within 24 hours of the FAQ, Server Scribe had Warcry updated. So we are able to go to that list builder and play around with the, the new points. Part of that was because Chris Lang has a Warcry data repo that quickly got updated. That's why my card creator and my dashboard are already up to date with the new profiles. And it'll also mean that HUD will be able to get the tabletop simulator version up to date pretty soon. 
We've also had videos from Salty C and Off Meta Musings, who turned those around in record time uh, and gave some React videos, which I found very useful to give a bit of context to some of the changes. If you hadn't had a chance yet, I do recommend checking them out. I'm also expecting to see Wargames on Toast video soon, and hopefully we'll see a Hoppy Jackal video. And we haven't seen a recent one for a while. I know he's busy in his home life, so uh, yeah, hopefully we see some there. I'm sure there are plenty more. Um, those are just first ones that came to mind. Please do comment uh, to let me know what your favorite Warcry channel is so I can check them out myself and hopefully we can put together a list. But yeah, my key point here is the FAQ Great and the Warcry community as well. Absolutely fantastic. So yeah, do check the Discord, check out these videos and yeah, I hope you have a great day. Thanks for making it all the way to the end. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Each week I put up a new video talking about one of Games Workshop's specialist games. The goal is always to try and make the best possible two-player experience. If this is something you'd find interesting, please subscribe to the channel and comment to let me know what you'd like to see in future.